So my name is Dr. Hall. Uh, show of hands, who is a physical therapist here in the room? And who is practicing currently in Louisiana? So I gave this lecture last year. I was thinking about actually mixing up just a bit, but you guys had a very important piece of legislation passed recently that states you guys have open access. Patients are allowed to come to you guys uh, without a referral of a physician. So a lot of this is going to be diagnosing um, and knowing when to manage or when to refer um, lower extremity injuries. So without further ado, financial disclosure. So the objectives of this lecture, we're gonna be discussing the evaluation and treatment of an ankle sprain, low ankle sprain, high ankle sprain, as well as a Liz Frank injury. Who here is familiar with the Liz Frank injury here? Okay, so that'll be something that we'll discuss, as well as turf toe, or first metatarsal flange joint sprain. Introduction to the ankle injury. 25% of all athletic injuries involve the ankle. Ankle injuries rank second among high school and collegiate athletic injuries. 40%, nearly half, have the potential to cause chronic issues. Um, so how often do we hear it's just a sprain? And I, and I see it a lot in my office, um, you know, athletic trainer, physical therapist, coach, uh, tells the patient that they just rolled their ankle. Um, and sometimes it is, it's an easy sprain that's easy to recover from. A lot of times it's not. A lot of times this will be, or could be a chronic issue if left undertreated or unmanaged. So the mechanism of injury, when we hear ankle sprain, most people think a low ankle sprain or lateral ankle sprain. Um, and it occurs from an inversion or internal rotational force applied to the foot while the ankle is in plantar flexion. The most common ligament injury is the anterior talofibular ligament followed by the calcaneofibular ligament. Um, biomechanical abnormalities, and this is important when we do our preseason assessments. Does a patient have a pes cavus foot or a high arch foot or do they have a pes planus or a flat foot? Um, those type of foot types do increase their risk of developing certain injuries. Particularly with the lateral ankle sprain, we see this more commonly in a patient that has a higher arch foot. Um, so it's important that we do these uh, pre-screenings. Here's a little bit of uh, anatomy here. This is the most common ligament injured with a low ankle sprain, the anterior talofibular ligament, followed by the calcaneofibular ligament, and then lastly the uh, posterior talofibular ligament. Incidence of injury. Basketball, by far and away, ranks number one of the reported lateral ankle sprains seen at any level. Um, you know, football, basketball, baseball. I grew up in Indiana. You know, basketball's number one, followed by football. So when I got down here, I'm seeing a lot of baseball um, and football injuries as well. But when I grew up playing basketball, we saw this all the time. Physical examination, this is very, very important. And this is maybe one of the most important slides of my entire lecture. What do we have to evaluate when a patient has ankle pain, particularly lateral ankle pain? Uh, number one, assessing the lateral collateral ligament, particularly over the anterior talofibular ligament. Two, the lateral malleolus, do they have a subsequent distal fibular fracture? Three, the syndesmosis, is this a high ankle sprain versus a low ankle sprain? Who in this room knows the difference between a high ankle sprain and a low ankle sprain? We're gonna go through that, because uh, that's important to know the difference. Um, anterior ankle joint, five, the anterior calcaneal process of the heel bone, do they have an avulsion fracture off of that? Six, the peroneal tendons, which is the group of tendons that support the lateral aspect of the ankle. And lastly, number seven, fifth metatarsal base. We often see a concomitant fifth metatarsal base fracture with a lateral ankle sprain. So it's important that we do this physical examination really quick. And this is something that takes, you know, about 30 seconds to do, but it's important that we do it and we don't just write this off or assume that it's just an ankle sprain. So again, evaluation, you know, typically you're going to see a patient with an acute ankle sprain. They are going to have some swelling. They're going to have some bruising. Um, the two most important tests that we do is a Taylor tilt test and an anterior draw test. The Taylor tilt test sets the integrity of the calcaneofibular ligament in which I'm going to show you guys what they look like on x-ray so you can actually appreciate a healthy ankle versus one that has a damaged uh, calcaneal fibular ligament as well as the anterior draw test that evaluates the integrity of the anterior talofibular ligament. Again, it's important to remember the anterior talofibular ligament is the number one ligament injured in a lateral ankle sprain. 
x-rays. This is a normal ankle. When you do a stress, you can see the abnormality there that occurs with a compromise or tear or partial tearing of the calcaneofibrillar ligament. And this is the difference between an anterior draw test. Look at the angle of the tibiotalocalcaneal joint versus when you stress distally, the anterior talofibular ligament is compromised. So that's how we tell the difference between which ligament is involved and to what degree that ligament is involved. Classification systems, grade one, grade two, grade three. Easy way to remember is a grade one is the first ligament or one ligament is involved, grade two, anterior talofibular ligament and calcaneofibular ligament involved, grade three, all three are compromised. That's the easiest way to remember um, and you can obviously talk about, is a patient able to bear weight, partial weight bear, non-weight bearing, and those typically correspond with the grade, but that's not as reliable as the uh, grade one, grade two, grade three. Treatment, a lateral ankle sprain without an associated Taylor dome lesion, without an associated peroneal tendon tear, without an associated osteochondral lesion, without an associated fifth metatarsal base fracture is typically non-surgical. So conservative treatment. Rice therapy, rest, ice, compress, elevate. Partial weight bearing in a boot for a couple weeks. Passive range of motion after one to two weeks. So these are the patients that you're gonna be seeing on a regular basis. When is it surgical? The three criteria that we use is one, a history of chronic lateral ankle instability or multiple lateral ankle injuries uh, to the same ankle. Conservative treatment has failed, immobilization has failed, physical therapy has failed, all the modalities that we do have failed, um, or a grade two acute rupture of lateral ankle ligaments in the elite or professional athlete. Post-op rehabilitation. This is very difficult. Dr. Cassio, Dr. Farmer kind of alluded to, talking the patient into following the post-op protocol is so important. Talking the parent into understanding that their 12-year-old son is not pitching for the Cubs tomorrow. Um, they need to understand that it takes time to heal. Um, and, and what I like to practice is evidence-based medicine. I know that if I go through my protocols, the likelihood of having a successful outcome is more so than following patient symptoms. So for a post-op lateral ankle stabilization or a Broadstrom procedure, um, six weeks non-weight bearing. You know, or excuse me, three weeks non-weight bearing, three to six weeks partial weight bearing. So we know that in approximately 14 to 16 weeks, that is four to four and a half months is the recovery time. So if a patient asks you, which you guys spend a lot more time with the patient, seeing them two or three times a week, six, eight, 10, 12 weeks at a time, they constantly ask you, when am I gonna be able to play? When am I gonna be able to play? You can give them an idea that in 14 to 16 weeks is the uh, predicted time frame for recovery of a low ankle sprain surgery. High ankle sprain. So. We know that a low ankle sprain is a tear of the lateral collateral ligaments of the ankle joint. A high ankle sprain is actually a tear of the ankle syndesmosis. So the mechanism of injury is entirely different. You're going to see a pronated foot with an externally rotated, or excuse me, internally rotated tibia. Um, and here you can kind of see just a little outline of what actually happens with that mechanism of injury, but it does take a significant force. And a lot of these do have a concomitant fibular fracture or ankle fracture associated with it more so than we see with a low ankle sprain. High ankle sprain. So very difficult athletic injury to treat due to its gross instability of the ankle. And you can see here the mechanism of injury, something that we see all too often uh, particularly in football or very, very high impact sports. Um, it takes a longer recovery time. Patients are gonna miss more time. In fact, nearly twice as much time as someone would with a low ankle sprain. So it's important to differentiate the two and explain to the patient that this is not your typical quote unquote ankle sprain. This is something that's more serious. Anatomy, anterior inferior tibiofibular joint or ligament is the number one injured ligament with a high ankle sprain, followed by the interosseous ligament. So we know that the interosseous ligament or the interosseous membrane is what connects the tibia and the fibula together. Um, 
This posterior group is the strongest, similar to a low ankle sprain. So we know that it's the anterior group that is most commonly compromised. Now, what else can happen with the high ankle sprain? You can see a, obviously you have the syndesmotic injury, which contributes to about 35% of the stability of the high ankle joint, followed by the interosseous ligament, uh, which is the most second ligament commonly ruptured. Third is the interosseous membrane, which is very weak, has very little stability, or provides very little stability to the ankle. And then lastly, is the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which is rarely involved, even in a terrible, terrible ankle fracture. I think I've only seen maybe three or four um, in which the entire complex is completely separated. And that contributes to 42% of the stability. Sport-specific injuries, it's usually the the contact or collision sports, excuse me, in uh, which you're gonna see some of these high ankle sprains. And again, key difference, high ankle sprains more likely require surgery than low ankle sprains do. Physical examination, the squeeze test, manual compression of the tibia and fibula simultaneously at the level of the mid leg causes an extreme amount of pain at the low ankle. This is a picture intraoperatively where a patient sustained a high ankle sprain and a concomitant fibular fracture. Once we repair the fibular fracture, we take a hook, called a hook test or cotton test, and we actually pull laterally. And if we see separation under intraoperal fluoroscopy, we will indeed put in a syndesmotic screw that more than likely will be taken out in our elite athletes uh, about 10, 12 weeks. Another physical examination is a stress abduction or external rotation test. Um, again, the foot is abducted while the leg is held and stabilized in the frontal plane. This will also give the patient an extreme amount of pain if positive. So those are the two tests that we can do quickly, the stress abduction and the squeeze test. This is an x-ray evaluation. Again, not all of them are going to be as obvious as the difference, but you can see that less than five millimeters between the tibia and fibula is considered normal. This is an abnormal anterior projection of the ankle, and you can also see an increase in the medial clear space, which is demonstrated here. Less than four millimeters is normal. That is considered abnormal. So we know that looking at the x-ray here, we know that there's a high ankle sprain MRI. We're also going to get a tib fib view to rule out a high fibular fracture. This is one of the most commonly missed fractures outside of the Liz Frank injury, which we'll get into inside the ER. When a patient comes acutely and says, hey, I rolled my ankle, and they get an x-ray and they say, oh, everything's fine. Well, you get a tib fib view and you can see that there actually has a fibular fracture. Very, very commonly missed. And then obviously stress radiographs. When in doubt, order a stress view because you might surprise yourself. Um, I've missed a couple of these, I'll be honest with you, without ordering a stress view. So now I'm definitely more cautious um, when, I'm, when I'm second guessing myself. But a stress radiographic view is so important when dealing with this type of injury. Treatment, the number one treatment difference between a low ankle sprain and a high ankle sprain in my estimation is I put these patients in a cast. You know, if I give them a boot, a patient will take that as a license that he wants me to walk. I'm gonna take it off, he wants me to walk. And that is just the inappropriate thing to do because you can increase or worsen this injury by weight bearing too early. So um, that is the number one thing to remember is that if, if I see a high ankle sprain or suspected high ankle sprain, they're getting a cast more so than getting a walking boot. Um, educating the coaches and athletes, that is so important. Athletes have a tremendous amount of pressure from teammates, from coaches, from parents. Uh, expectations that they return to the field, they're going to tell you they're fine. A lot of times they're not and we'll certainly get into the, the mental psyche of the athlete when they're recovering before you return them to, uh, to full sports or competition. Non-weight bearing treatment options. This is pretty cool. There's the eye walk free, there's the toad brace, and then there's the total contact cast. It's basically a boot with fiberglass wrapped around it so I know the patient can't take it off. I do this more often than you believe because patients just cannot be trusted at times. It's true, it's true. Candidates for surgical treatment. So we know that if they have a high ankle sprain with a syndesmotic injury with frank diastasis or an associated fracture, that is a surgical candidate. This is a mind-blowing statistic. One millimeter of lateral displacement of the fibula decreases the tibial Taylor contact by 42% takes one millimeter. So what, what does that mean? It means that if that is not perfectly reduced, 
they are going to develop a rapid post-injury arthritic change if it's not successfully reduced. And I have seen more of these in my office in the past two, two and a half years here in Lake Charles with kids 18, 19, 20 years old with advanced arthrosis of the ankle because of a missed high ankle sprain. So it, it is important, and that's why a lot of these, most of these actually, are indeed surgical in my estimation. I'm a lot more conservative with, with my low ankle sprains, with my high ankle sprains. Um, we talk surgery sooner than later in most cases. And then obviously a high ankle sprain without a fracture that just has not responded to conservative modalities. So those are the two criteria um, that we utilize for surgical treatment of a high ankle sprain. Post-op rehabilitation. So back to our low ankle sprain, you start to walk these at about week three, week four. With the high ankle sprain, strict six weeks non-weight bearing. Six to 12 weeks protected weight bearing with a boot. We may translate them to an ASO, which is an ankle stabilizing orthotic, and begin range of motion activity, but six to 12 weeks. And then a lot of times we do take them back to remove the syndesmotic screw. We wouldn't want that to break while the patient returns to full activity, or excuse me, activity. So 14 to 16 weeks, that is four to five months for a patient to be out following a high ankle sprain or associated ankle fracture surgery for a patient to return to full activity. So something to also keep in mind as far as the post-op rehab, how long am I gonna be out? Four to five months following ankle fracture surgery. The Liz Frank injury. It was first introduced by Dr. Liz Frank in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, you would see this injury with the foot getting caught in the stirrup while riding a horse. How would they treat this? Back during that time, they would amputate the midfoot. Um, now that we, we've come more evolved and we understand uh, the basic principles of fracture fixation, uh, we fix these. You know, we fix them, but it is a devastating injury. Uh, Darren McFadden, Maurice Jones-Drews, Antonio Holmes, a lot of these guys, this is what ended their careers. Um, Cowboys felt it was necessary to sign Darren McFadden, but you know, it is what it is. Mechanism of injury, fixed forefoot plantar flexion and forefoot abduction. That is key and I have some, uh, some cartoon pictures to kind of show you what exactly uh, is happening during these types of injuries. So here's an example of a soccer player. You can see zoomed in, injury to the midfoot. Football player, same type of thing, injury to the midfoot. Tackle, injury to the midfoot. So anatomy. So there is a very complex group of ligaments that's helped stabilize this midfoot. This structure needs to be stable for mid stance as part of a normal walking or running uh, phase of gait. Now notice that there is no ligament between the first and second metatarsal bases making this the weakest portion of the tarsometatarsal complex. There is the Liz Frank ligament, which runs from the medial cuneiform to the base of the second met, which you can kind of see there. That is the strongest of the dorsal ligaments, but the dorsal ligaments are notoriously weaker than the plantar ligaments, which is why you see more of a dorsal dislocation than a plantar dislocation with these types of injuries. Second metatarsal. You guys see how this base of the second metatarsal is recessed more so than the first and the third? That is what we call the keystone. This is the strongest portion of the area. Um, little motion occurs, so it takes a substantial amount of force to disrupt um, this type of injury. And you know, obviously you'll see outside of an athlete, uh, a lot of motor vehicle accidents or high collision uh, type injuries do also lead to these types of injuries. Physical examination, edema. You're not gonna see a gross homolateral dislocation of the foot a lot of times. Um, but edema, plantar midfoot swelling, what we call Maunder sign, is highly suggestive of a Liz Frank injury, particularly marked tenderness over the midfoot. Um, this is something to certainly be concerned with that this is more so than just a contusion or a hurt foot per se. Two physical examinations uh, that I like to do are the piano key test in which you grasp the toes and go up and down um, and that puts a substantial amount of stress here on the midfoot. Um, and that is a very, very easy way to tell if there's some type of damage to that structure. Same with the single heel race test. Asking a patient to go up like this puts a substantial amount of stress on their midfoot. Um, both are very, very easy to help you with your diagnosis of a Liz Frank injury. 
radiographic evaluation, as I said before, high ankle sprains with a concomitant high fibular fracture, commonly missed in the ER, as are Liz Frank, because they're subtle. Not all of them are as obvious as that dorsal displacement or that gapping between the first and second metatarsal base. So what do you do if the plain films prove inconclusive? Well, I will always order a contralateral film to get an idea of what the other foot looks like. Uh, secondly, almost always we'll get a CT scan. A stress view is helpful, but when you have an acute injury, any type of stress examination is going to be tremendously painful. Um, and in my private office, I just am not equipped with, with the anesthesia necessary, so a CT scan is often very helpful uh, for both diagnosis and surgical planning. Surgical treatment methods. Um, more times out of not, in my athletes, we're going to go ahead and open, reduce, and internally fixate these. Uh, what we look for for adequate reduction is we look to follow the second metatarsal base lining up with the second cuneiform. This right here, more times than not, causes what we call PTA or post-traumatic arthritis. And nearly all of my patients that undergo an open reduction internal fixation of more than just if they have an associated fracture of any of these metatarsal bases, I tell them that you will be likely back on my operating table in 10, 15, 20 years for a revisional midfoot fusion um, because the post-traumatic arthritis rates are just so significant. Um, this is an injury that I likely would not wish upon my best friend. This and a heel fracture, which uh, we'll save that lecture for another day, but this is a very, very, very uh, life-changing injury, much less um, a sports injury. Post-op rehab. This is a 16 to 20 week recovery, four to five months. Um, so everything we've talked about, low ankle sprain, you come back the quickest. The next is the high ankle sprain, the midfoot fracture, 16 to 20 weeks. And if you follow this post-op rehab protocol like I do, um, we can typically stay online. And that's how you know if the patient's recovering or not. You know, not if they're still symptomatic at week eight or week 12, but what should we be doing between week eight and week 12? We should be being able to accomplish full range of motion exercise. We should be able to be full weight bearing with or without a CFO or custom functional orthotic. And if we're not there, then we know that something is likely wrong and maybe we need to go in and, and check on or, or see uh, what we can do to, to determine if this is something that's gonna be symptomatic or if this is something that's just taking a lot longer to heal than normal. But, but having these protocols and practicing evidence-based medicine is so critical uh, to successful outcomes in my practice. And last but not least, turf toe. So turf toe is caused by a sudden hyperextension of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint resulting in a sprain of the involved capsule and ligamentous structures that stabilize the first MPJ. Uh, originally described by Dr. Bowers and Dr. Martin, which were team physicians of uh, University of West Virginia. Uh, common injury in athletes that play on artificial grass or turf. Why is this? Well, it's believed that artificial turf um, is a much harder surface than grass, uh, has a lot less give, um, and it tends to stick a little bit more to the cleat, uh, which, which lends itself to, to increased risk of injury of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Mechanisms of injury. It can occur in any sport in which the forefoot is fixed plantar flex position with direct or indirect force of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint in a hyperextension. Uh, so why does it occur, more, most, or occur less commonly in basketball than in football or soccer? Uh, Many have postulated, many have written articles, many have documented, but it is believed a lot of it has to do with the tennis shoe. A lot of it has to do with the structure of the shoe and the surface that you're playing on. Um, and we know that shoe gear in football and soccer is much more flexible in the forefoot. It allows for increased agility and speed um, and, and subsequently does sacrifice stability and protection in, in many cases. This is a very busy slide, but we're going to go over the basic anatomy over the first metatarsal phalangeal. We know that propulsion or that oomph in your step is made possible with this, with this uh, structure here. So the four common or the four most important structures of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint are the plantar plate, the sesamoids, the flexor lucis brevis tendon, and the collateral ligaments. Now it's going to be very difficult to assess uh, which exactly of those structures are injured during a physical examination, but I will give you a very easy physical examination that you guys can do to determine if this is truly a uh, turf toe or first metatarsal flanger joint sprain um, type of injury. And that is the dorsal to plantar draw test of the Lachman test. And you basically grasp the toe 
and you move it in a sagittal direction. If you've got complete instability or subluxing of that great toe joint, the patient likely has a plantar plate injury. Physical examination. Pain, swelling, gross malalignment are obvious signs of turf toe. I've seen more turf toe in my office in this past month um, than I have in the past several weeks, but um, a lot of them are non-surgical. They, they, they really are, unless they've got an associated fracture dislocation of one of the tibial fibular sesamoids, or the inner sesamoidal ligament is intact and the toe is grossly subluxed or dislocated, a lot of these will respond very, very well to conservative care. Radiographic evaluation. Again, just like with the Liz Frank, I always order a bilateral film to assess the difference. How can I tell if there's a, a, a soft tissue injury on an x-ray? Well, you can see the difference between the two. You see how recessed or proximal migrated those sesamoids are compared to a normal foot film. The proximal migration is indicative of a ligamentous injury holding the sesamoids to the base of the proximal phalanx. Um, when I see this, we're instantly getting an MRI to determine is there an associated tendon tear? Do they have pain with range of motion? Is there associated extensor or flexor tendon tear? Um, besides just the gross plantar plate or ligament tear um, that is defined by the injury. First MPJ injury classification system. Um, this is a very, very easy way to kind of take into picture um, the recovery time that's necessary for these injuries. A lot of times, we can get these guys right back into the game. You know, we put them in a tape, we get a custom orthotic with the Morton's extension, um, but in other areas, when they do have complete disruption of the plantar structures, they don't have inability or stability of the first met with loading, um, long-term immobilization or even surgery is necessary. Um, and you can see the difference between some being able to return to play immediately with just taping versus 10 to 16 weeks out of activity. So there's a very, very large discrepancy as far as injury of that area. Again, here are some conservative treatments, many of which you guys do on a regular basis for our athletes. Uh, taping and padding, custom orthotics with a Morton's extension under that first metphalangeal joint to give that stability, minimize its range of motion, a cam walker, and uh, rest ice compress elevation therapy. So who are candidates for surgical treatment? Um, Surgical intervention is required if a complete plantar plate rupture is evident with frank instability uh, with or without sesamoid fracture. So you can see here that this is one edge of this, the uh, plantar plate and this is the other. So what we look for is we actually look to identify that long flexor tendon to see if there's any associated injury with that. The recovery time with an open repair, strict non-weight bearing four weeks, gradual range of motion at week one or two to help minimize adhesions. But strict non-weight bearing for four weeks is critical for this injury to uh, be successfully um, healed up. Now, who in this room knows who uh, Deion Sanders is? This is the injury that ruined his career. He had chronic first MPJ instability and that is what led to his demise. So, evidence-based medicine protocol. I've been preaching it, Dr. Farmer's been treating it, Dr. Cassio will treat it, uh, or speak on it rather, that this is how we get our patients back to the game at a predictable recovery rate. Uh, regardless of the lower extremity being treated, the key to safely returning to sport is implementing a three-phase treatment protocol, an acute protection phase, a subacute rehab phase, and an advanced rehab phase. So the goal, protect, range of motion and edema during our acute phases. Protection with whatever we choose to take, whether it's taping, bracing, orthotic, cam walker, cast, we're protecting. Range of motion, immediate versus delayed, based on the injury, based on the structures we're trying to immobilize, either we, we, we delay our range of motion or we get that as part of our protocol uh, right away. And then lastly is edema. You know, once we get out of this phase, we move on to the subacute phase. The goal of the subacute phase is increase strength and function, improve cardiovascular status and promote neuromuscular and proprioceptive function. We achieve this by doing strengthening exercises, cardiovascular exercises, neuromuscular and proprioception exercises. We initiate this once pain and swelling is resolved and the athlete is comfortably ambulating without pain. Very, very important to take into consideration. Comfortably without pain. And then lastly, advanced rehab phase. What is the goal? To return that patient to the sport specific uh, sport that, that that athlete plays. 
Um, we don't just do, you know, agility or, or run in a straight line and back, okay, you're clear to go back to your particular sport. No. We actually test them. We have a basketball player dribble while performing drilling cuts. You know, a soccer player doing what they do and a football player running routes and catching footballs. This is very, very important to predict when this patient is going to be back. This is the most difficult phase in my estimation for you guys. And why I say that is, is because you have a patient running without pain. Dad is coming to pick up, you know, the athlete from physical therapy. When can he return to sports? When can he go? He's able to run, he's able to jump, he's able to move, he's able to do all these things, but he's not been released yet. Sports specific exercise when you really got to hold on to your guns and do these things with these athletes before we truly release them back into sport. So what to expect once the athlete is cleared? So once an athlete suffers an ankle sprain, up to 80% of those athletes may suffer a recurrent sprain. Up to 72 may develop recurring symptoms of chronic instability. So average recovery times. This is something that every patient, every patient father, every coach will ask, how long is he going to be out? Well, with a lateral ankle sprain that's non-surgical, we can expect about 28 days or four weeks. With a high ankle sprain, in the absence of surgery, we can expect about 55 days or eight weeks. That is a substantial difference between the two, which is why it's so critical to understand the difference between a low ankle sprain and a high ankle sprain because they're two different things. Um, after six months, a study published out of uh, Dr. Hopkins and Dr. Gerber, 38% of athletes, nearly 40%, still reported signs of instability following an injury of a high ankle injury. So that is one of the most significant injuries that an athlete can, can suffer uh, in the lower extremity is a high ankle sprain. And then the psychological factor. Studies suggest up to 19% of athletes will experience psychological distress levels while recovering from an injury. These levels are much the same as a patient receiving treatment for a mental health illness. So athletes that are demonstrating apprehension, fear, and anxiety are at a much greater risk of re-injury, and there's often a deleterious effect on athletic performance. I think this was really brought to mainstream with Derrick Rose's injury with the Chicago Bulls. He had been cleared by athletic trainers, by physicians, by surgeons, by the team. He was just not ready to return. He was not ready to return. Um, so that is something to also kind of keep in mind. You know, the, there's an old saying that says practice makes perfect, and uh, I vehemently disagree with that. Practice makes permanent. And if they're permanently or they're, they're running through the drills, you know, three-quarter of the time or, or they're not fully there, I think they will always kind of have that effect that, you know what, I may re-injure myself, which puts them at a more risk of injury um, than the recovery itself. So something to kind of keep in mind and something to look for um, when you're treating these athletes when they're getting to the subacute to the advanced rehab phase. And then multidisciplinary approach, you know, physicians and surgeons, physical therapists, athletic trainers, psychologists, dietitians and nutritionists, coaching staff, athletes, parents and families, getting them all on the same page, understanding that these are indeed injuries, that these are indeed, you know, not only are they athletes, but they're people, you know, and a lot of these people don't make it to the professional level. And you don't want these issues to be lingering when they're in 20s and 30s or 40s. Um, with regular jobs. So it's important to kind of understand that we're all in this together and there's not one person that's more important than the other. So a multidisciplinary approach is key to success, I believe, with treating our athletic uh, population. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions for me about anything? All right. Thank you so much.